Welcome to Finding Holiness, where we delve into timeless Torah wisdom, revealing the sacred in everyday moments. Join us on a journey to elevate your spirituality and discover holiness in every aspect of life. I'm your host, Rabbi David Kadosh, and together, let's embark on a path of spiritual exploration. I hope you enjoy this next episode. Erev Tov, everybody. Welcome to another edition of our Thursday night Parashat HaShavua class, studying Parashat Vayera. Great crowd here we have tonight. We have uh, some people online. We have a lot more in person, eating some very delicious hamin. Uh, tonight's class is sponsored by Dr. and Mrs. Charles Botbol in memory of her mother, Gittel Bat Malka Zichonai Racha, the words of, t- of Torah that we say tonight, shall be le'ilu nishmata ti nashat rabi tzorah hayim. Amen. <clears throat> so again, welcome everyone who is here live, who is listening online live, who is listening to the podcast, the recording um, on Finding Holiness. Always got to gotta push the podcast, of course, findingholiness.buzzsprout.com or findingholiness.com, the new website where you can access all the archived shiurim. Thank you to everyone that's supporting the podcast, Baruch Hashem, and uh, the, the various shiurim. Tonight we are studying, like I said, Parashat Vayera. Uh, more specifically, uh, one of the many episodes that take place in the parashats, filled with so much information, of course highlighted by Akedat Yitzchak, which is at the end of the of the parasha, but also found in the the Torah portion is the destruction of the city of Sedom. Sedom, notoriously known for their lack of hospitality and as well as lewdness and much more averot that the people of Sedom. Um, did throughout their lives, and God decided that this was a city that didn't deserve to exist, and hence he, uh, he destroyed it in a very supernatural way. However, due to, uh, I guess, his kindness, he felt that Lot and his family should be saved and not be destroyed with the, the rest of the, of the residents. <clears throat> and during this salvation, Lot is warned by the Malachim, by the angels, specifically not to look back. Do not look back as they are fleeing the city. Lot's wife disregards the warning and looks back, and the Torah tells us that she is transformed into a pillar of salt. This is what happens. It's very unusual uh, punishment by HaKadosh Baruch Hu, a punishment that we never see uh, take place again. So what I want to do tonight, Bezrat Hashem, is go through the story a little bit and why specifically this punishment. There is a vital lesson to be learned here. Lot uh, adhered to the Malachim's strict warnings and was saved. The wife did not. There is actual, actually a halakha in Shuchan Aruch. I don't know how many of you know this halakha, but there is a halakha that says, Haro'e ishto shel Lot, someone who sees Lot's wife, obviously there, there must be somewhere a pillar of salt that was Lot's wife, and it's still there. Mevarech shayim, you say tu berachot, when you see this. Aleha omer, when you see Lot's wife, you say, Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu menech haolam, dayan haemet. That's the beracha you say for Lot's wife. Ve'alot Omer, and if you to see Lot, you would say, Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech haolam, zocher ha-tzadikim. Hashem who remembers the, the tzadikim, the, the righteous. Now, the source of this berachat is in Masech Berachot, Daf Nun Dalet Amud Bet. The berachat of Dayan Haemet is appropriate for Lot's wife. She was punished and she died. And the bracha for Zocher HaTzadikim is appropriate for Lot. Why? Because he was saved in the merit of Abraham Avinu. That's the tzaddik that we are remembering. The Gemara tells us, I'm going to be a Hanan, Afilu Bishat Kaso Shel HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Zocher HaTzadikim. Even when HaKadosh Baruch Hu is angry, God remembers the tzaddikim. Shnei Mar, as the Pasuk says in this week's parasha, Vahi Beshachet Elohim et Arei HaKikar, when God is destroying the cities, of the plain, of the, uh, of the plain of Kikar, Vayizkor Elohim et Abraham. God remembered Abraham, Vayishalach et Lot mitocha afecha. So he sent Lot from the midst of all that upheaval. So, a few questions here. Number one, 
why did Lot's wife, looking back at the upheaval, um, cause Hashem's wrath to such a degree that she deserves such a punishment? That's one. Uh, also, we have we know the principle of mida keneged mida, right? <laughs> measure for measure. And uh, based on the famous words in the Mishnah, "Bamida sheada moded ba modedim lo." All right, the, the, the way that a person deals with others, that's how Hakadosh Baruch Hu deals with him. So, if that's the case, how is this punishment mida keneged mida? How is this punishment of Lot's wife measure for measure? And is there a lesson? to learn from here, and what is that, what is that lesson? Okay, so let's look at the events described by the Torah with Rashi's commentary. The Torah tells us when the Malach ad- admonishes and rebukes Lot, as they took them out, he said, the Malach said, flee for your life, don't look behind you, don't stop anywhere in the plain, Flee to the mountain, because if not, you're going to be wiped out, obliterated. Rashi says, don't look behind you. What's the meaning? Because you did evil with, like them. And the only reason you are going to be saved is in the merit of Abraham. And you don't deserve to witness their punishment while you are being saved. That's why Rashi says, don't look, don't look back. How does the Torah describe the upheaval of Sedom. The Torah says, again, this week's parasha, Badonai himtir al Sedom balamora gofrit va'esh met Hashem in Hashemayim. God rained upon Sedom and Amora sulfur and fire from the heavens, from Hashem from the heavens. Vayafoch et ha'arim ha'el ve'et kol ha'kikar. God turned over the, all the cities. Ve'et kol yoshvei ha'arim ve'tzemach ha'adama. Even all the greenery and the, what sprouted from the, from the, from the ground. Vatabet ishto me'aharav vatehi nesiv nesiv melach. So Lot's wife, Lot's wife looked back, and behold, she became a pillar of salt. So <clears throat> Rashi says, what does it mean she became a pillar of salt? Rashi says, she sinned with salt. That was her avera. She sinned with salt. So midah kenege midah, she was stricken with salt. How did she sin with salt? So during a conversation that they were having, when they were bringing in guests, Lot said to her, give a little bit of salt to these guests, specifically these, uh, these malachim that came in. So what did she answer, Lot? She answered, even this bad custom of giving salt, you want me to do? You plan to put this in practice here in this place, Sedom? You want me to give them salt? So that was her sin. So because Lot said, give them salt. She said, I didn't give them salt for it. That's not a minhag here. It's not the minhag of the makom. And therefore, that was her sin. She got punished with salt. So, the text said that she got punished because she looked back. She was told not to look back. She looked back. She got punished. So, why does Rashi say that she was punished because she refused to give the guests salt? It was, which one is it? Because she looked back or because she refused to give the guests salt? So, the Chachamim say it's really both. She was punished because she neglected to hear the Malach's uh, command. However, at the same time, she warranted that specific punishment because she didn't want to offer the guests even a, a little bit of salt. And we're going to get to the significance of the salt as we go in the shiur. Now, the entire matter of Lot's request is very, very puzzling. <clears throat> Especially the one concerning the salt I'm talking about. Firstly, she already agreed to give the malachim food. She, she agreed. They're, they're, they're sitting down at the table. So they have, they have some sort of meal. The pasuk actually says, Vayas lahem mishte umatzot tafa ve'ochel. He made for them a, a, a mishte, and he gave them matzot. So if that's the case, why did she refuse to give them a little bit of salt? If you're going to refuse hospitality in general, don't, don't welcome them, don't give them anything. But you're already providing them matzot tafa, you have them bread on the table, give them a little bit of salt. Why is she, why is she refusing the salt? Okay? Um... <clears throat> Second, uh, the pasuk says that Lot gave him the, the, the meal. Why didn't Lot give him the salt? <laughs> right? Why he had to tell the wife to give the salt? If the, if the salt was such an important thing, have Lot give him the salt. And third, her punishment being transformed into a pillar of salt doesn't really seem to be midah keneged midah. You're not going to tell me that she's going to die and turn into a pillar of salt just because she lacked to give a little bit of salt on the table. Like, it doesn't seem to be commensurate with the with the... With the mere refusal to give them some salt. 
So it says Rav Pinchas Friedman, who we we speak about uh, every Thursday night most of the time, an unbelievable chidush. And he says, based on the words of Rav, Rav Shushan of Ostropoli, very big tzaddik, zecher tzaddik, libracha, he says, the significance of the Malach's warning to Lot was as follows. Don't look behind you. That basically, Lot was relying on the premise that he and his daughters would be saved from the fate of Sedom because of the dynasty of David, David Amelech, that was going to come from his daughters, was destined to descend from him. Last week in Parashat Lechecha, when Abraham Avinu was commanded to leave his land, Lech Lecha, Me'at Secha, Mimolat Secha, the Torah tells us, Vayikach Abraham et Sarai ishto v'et Lot ben Achiv, he took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his uh, brother's son, v'et kore chusham asher achashu, v'yavo arza kenan. They left Haran um, to go to Eretz Kenan. Zohar HaKadosh asked a question, Ma hama Avraham le dabke aimelot? What, what possessed Abraham, Abraham at the time to take Lot with him? I understand your wife. I understand your possessions. I understand maybe the people. Why Lot? Clearly, he was not such a tzaddik if he chose to settle in Sedom in last week's parasha as well. So why, why bring Lot along? So Zohar answers, Ela begin de tzafa beruach ha-kodesh tezami mimne David. Because Abraham foresaw with Ruach HaKodesh that from Lot was going to come David, Melech Israel, and that was destined to come from him. And therefore he took Lot to protect that holy spark inside of him. Not only that, it's also hinted in the Pasuk in last week's parasha. The Pasuk says, Vegam le Lot, haolechet Abraham, Lot who went with Abraham, hayat sonu bakar ve'oalim. The Pasuk in its literal form was, is, is meant to tell us that Lot had a lot of wealth as well. He had son, bakar, ve'ohalim, and tents. I mean, he had tents. What kind of, who cares if he has tents? We count people's tents, we count their flock. That's, that's what, that was the money back then. That was the currency, how much sheep and cattle you had. What do I care about your tents? So the, the Midrash says, Raftuvi Abar Yitzchak Amar Shene Ohalim, he had two tents. Ruth HaMoabiyah V'Na'ama Amonit. Those were the two tents that he had. The kavate kum kachet ishtecha ushne benotecha nimsaot. When the pasuk says in this week's parasha, take your wife and your two daughters who are found amongst you. Who are these two daughters? Shte metziot ruta moavia benama moavi. These are the two great descendants that were going to come from Lot, and hence that is also hinted in the pasuk. Matzati David Abdi in Teilim. I found David, my servant. Hechan metzativ. Where do I found him? The midrash says bistom. I found David in Sedom. Because that's where Lot came from and, Ru- and, and, his, and his two daughters, who were, of course, the matriarchs of Ruta Moabiyah and Naama uh, Amonit. So that's the introduction that's brought by the Zohar and Rav Shimshom el And therefore, it start, things are starting to come into play and, and, and the puzzle is starting to piece together. When Lot left Sedom, when Lot left Sedom, the Pasuk tells us, Vait Mama, he delayed, the Shar says it there. He delayed. Vayachaziku anashim beyado. The angels grabbed him. They had to force him. Uviad ishto, uviad shte benotav. Bechemlat Hashem ala, vayotziu vayinichu michutz la'ir. They literally forced him out of there. He didn't want to leave. Lot didn't want to leave because he had to grab onto his hand. Why? Why he didn't want to leave? You, you can't see the whole city around you is going to... Is, is going to shreds, rip to shreds, fire, uh, you know, gofrit, va'esh, sulfur, you can witness like volcano ash coming all over the place. Can't imagine, everyone has, you know, their own visual uh, imagine, imagination of what's happening in that place. No, I don't want to go, I want to stay. I mean, you want to stay. Get out. So why, is, why do the malachim have to grab them to pull them out? Why aren't they running on their own? So, this is similar to what we actually find later on in Chumash with regards to Korach. In Parashat Korach, it said, what prompted Korach to, com- to commit his, his crime? He said he had such chokhmah, his vision, his vision misled him. That's what Rashi says. Because he saw that in the future, there was going to be somebody who was going to be a, a huge Jewish leader. He's referencing Shmuel Navi. Shmuel Navi came from the sons of Korach. So he said to himself, nothing's going to happen to me. I, I see, Shmuel and is coming from me. I'm fine. So therefore, I got nothing to worry about. So he, he continued with this uh, rebellion against, uh, against Moshe Rabbeinu. And, and, 
And because I got I got Shmuel, he didn't know that it was, it was going to come from his sons who did Teshuvah, but Korach himself got to Allah. Moshe also, we see this. Moshe, when he kills the Egyptian, the, the Torah says, Vayyar Korach, Vayyar Kien Ish. He looked here and there and he saw that there was no man and he killed the Egyptian. What was it? He saw there was no man. He saw, Rashi says, he saw, and Moshe saw that in the future, no one's going to come from this man. No one important was going to come from this man. So, and that's why, that's why he doesn't need to be spared. So now, being that Lot, Realizing he was going to be rescued, not in his own merit, but in the merit of David HaMelech. I know that David HaMelech is going to come from me. He, he understood that. And therefore, he delayed. He delayed without fearing for his life. You know, in times of, of mortal danger, you have the Satan that starts to mess around with your head. You know, HaKadosh Baruch Hu could have found alternate ways of, of, uh, of uh, uh, producing the dynasty of David. Right? But, uh, but, but the Malachim grabbed him. And said, no, you, you gotta flee for your life. Al tabet me'acharecha. The message of don't look behind you was not a literal don't look behind you. It was don't look at the generations that are going to come after you. Don't think that you're gonna be saved just because David Melech is coming. No. Even if you, it does not think, if you look back, if that's the only reason, you're gonna be obliterated. Me'acharecha means it's what's coming after you. Al tabet. Don't look at what's coming after you. So when the, when the Pasuk says that his wife glanced back, again, it's not to be taken literally. Rashi says she looked behind Lot. She, meaning she looked behind Lot. She also wasn't afraid of dying. She also knew that there was a David coming. She was cognizant of the fact that David Amelech and the dynasty was destined to, to come from Lot. So she was confident that it was going to come from her and Lot. So therefore, but she didn't know that it was going to be from Lot and the daughters. Right? She, she thought, I'm white, it's coming for me. I don't have to save myself. I'm fine over here. So she did not comply with the Malach's instructions. And this is the explanation of Rabbi Shemba Surabali. Unbelievable. So now, let's go back to this dispute between Lot and the wife at that meal. He said, give salt to the guests. This is what he said. And she said, this is the custom, this is the minhad that you want to have. We don't do this custom here. We didn't do this. We didn't do this in Morocco. Yeah, that's what, that's what they all say. We didn't do this. This is not our custom. Okay, so what's happening? What's the significance of the salt on the table? So some of you might know that the significance of the salt on the table comes from the korbanot. We have a mitzvah, one of the positive mitzvot in our Torah, one of the 613 mitzvot. In every korban mincha, you have to put salt. Ve'lot tashbit melach berit elohecha. You cannot, you may not discontinue the salt of, of uh, God's covenant, me'al minchatecha from your korban mincha, al kor korban mincha, agrib melach, and all of your korbanot, you have to offer salt. So now, the Gemara Masechem Menachot sees these three words, velo tashbi melach, you may not discontinue the salt. So what does that mean? Gemara says, haba melach she'ena shovetet ve'ezo. This teaches you that you have to bring salt that is never discontinued. Which is what? Zo melach sedomit. This is the sodomite salt. Melach from Sedom. Rashi explains that this salt is found in both the summer and the winter. And it's, it's thrown by the sea onto the bank. So this is not man-made salt, table salt that I guess we, we buy in the store for a dollar for uh, two kilos or whatever it is. This is found in the sea. And this is the specific salt that is needed for the korbanot. It's a lot of shbit melach brit elohecha, brit elokecha. So now, let's go a step deeper. We're going to get back to this. When a person is dying, lo aleinu, the malacha mavet, the Gemara tells us in Masechet Abu Lazarat, the malacha mavet comes. How does the malacha mavet look? He's full of eyes. This is what Gemara in Abu Lazarat says, full of eyes. Uh, Rabbi Rab Yonatan Aibshut Zechet Sadiq Vachal we quoted last week says this is the meaning of the Pasuk Velo Taturu Achare Levachem Vachare Enechem Asher Atem Zonim Acharehem that you should not follow after your heart and after your eyes that which is uh, which will lead you astray so Rashi says what does that mean the eye sees the heart is the desires is the Cheshek and the body is what commits the sins that's the way it works I see oh that looks good the desire comes to eat that, and then the body actually eats what you're not supposed to eat. Um, there's another Gemara that says that the Yetzara only prevails with what the person sees. And the Yetzara only prevails with what the with, with what the person sees. 
That's what gives him the, the force. That's what gives him the koach. Now, the Satan, the Yetzirah, the Malach HaMavet are all the same. They're all the same being. That's brought down Gemara Masechet Ba'abatra. Uh, what does it mean? First, the Yetzirah comes to lure and mislead the people. That's the Yetzirah in the Yetzirah form. And then it goes up to prosecute the person in Shamayim. That's the Satan form. Okay? And then once the person is uh, stand for Mita, God forbid, then it comes in the, in the Malach HaMavet form. So the Malach HaMavet performs several roles here. It's, and, it's, and while it's performing the role, it's described as full of eyes, right? Full of eyes. Because, because it stemmed from the eyes of the sin that you saw, and then the Satan is, is up there prosecuting, and then and it's coming down over here. Since the Yetzirah only prevails based on what a person sees, that's what we said, then it, it has its koach. It's only empowered by the prohibited sights that cause a person to sin. And that's what generates the eyes on the Malach HaMavid. When at that moment, when a person experiences the Malach HaMavid, and he sees his eyes, it's the eyes, your eyes, that you saw that, that caused you to sin. Now, why do I bring a Korban? I bring a Korban to atone for a sin. Okay, that, the, the rationale of bringing salt with all the Korbanot the Korbanot is to atone what a person did with his thought, with his speech, and with his action. In fact, famous Ramban says that all the steps of the Korbanot are based on that. First, you lean on it with your hands. That corresponds to the act. Then you confess verbally. That's called the vidui. That corresponds to the speech. You burn the intestines and the, and the kidneys in fire because that, that corresponds to the thoughts and the desire that a person has. You sprinkle the blood on the Mizbeach. That's the lifeblood that is being affected through, through your sin. Everything in, in the Korban that takes place in the Korban is, has to do with, uh, with, our, with our Averot. And the Korban is a substitute. Really, we're killing the animal. Because really, we deserve the punishment, right? The same idea when we shuck the chickens on the uh, Kippur, right? The Kaparot, same idea. The korban is a kapara for us. So this is the meaning. Adam, al Chachamim say this is the meaning. Adam ki akriv mikem korban Hashem. Beginning of parashat Vayikra. When a man amongst you brings a korban to Hashem, the essential function of the korban is to, is to stimulate the person that's bringing it to recognize, I, I made a big mistake. And this is why I bring in korban. In fact, it's mikem. It's from you. Kilu, it's, it's, it's you. Akadosh Baruch mercifully allowed the animal to take your place, but it's really you. In fact, the word Mikem is an acronym of Mida Keneged Mida. Mida Keneged Mida, Mem Kaf Mem, which is a person needs to recognize that everything that's being done to that animal should be rightfully done to that, to you, measure for measure. So now, what's the rationale for bringing the salt of Sedom with the Korbanot? The Gemara Neruvim says, Mipene Ma Amru Maim Acharonim Chova. Why do why is there a law that when you do Maim Acharonim, of course Maim Acharonim is a little water that you pour on your fingertips at the end of the meal. It's a chova, it's obligatory, you have to do it. Why is it a chova? Because there is a salt of Sedom that blinds the eyes. This is the answer that the Gemara gives. So what how does Rashi explain this? That that there when we eat salt at the conclusion of the meal, this is the problem. And salt, we, we, you know, people see with their hands, I guess, so not, not so much forks and knives. So they instituted the practice of, of my maharonim. And that's why, this is why we bring sedom salt for the korbanot, because it symbolizes to overcome all the influence and, and um, influence of the yetzer hara by safeguarding the kedusha of my eyes. This is what it is. And that's why Dafka says, yes, mela sedomit yes shem sameta anayim. That blinds the eyes. That specifically used that, uh, that term. Meaning, it's not going to be necessary to seek atonement for, uh, through the Koranot. Okay? But rather, I'm bringing this salt. What we're saying now is that this, this, my maharonim is in a way taking place of the Koranot. That salt that was supposed to be with the Korban that symbolized that we have to blind ourselves <laughs> from things that we are prohibited to look at. This is maybe why Akadosh Baruch Hu created this type of salt in Sedom. The people of Sedom were very evil. Last week's parasha, the people of Sedom were exceedingly wicked, 
and sinful to God. You learn about their wickedness based on something we see very carefully in Pasuk. In Pasuk, before that, it said, Vaisa Lot et Ainav. Lot raised his eyes. This is last week's parasha. Vayar et kol kikar yarden. This is after he split with, uh, with uh, Avram. He looked, raised up his eyes and he saw the entire plain of the Yarden. Kikula that it was all watery. Before God destroyed Sedom and Amora. Rashi says here on this pasuk, why did Lot choose the vicinity of, of Sedom and Amora? Because they were immersed in lewdness. In Arayot. This is what was the problem with, with Lot. And he compares the language as Vaisa Lot et Enav with the language that was that is given with Potiphar's wife and Yosef. Uh, Potiphar's wife, it also says, Vatisa Eshet Adonav et Eneha. Again, the eyes. She raised, the wife of Potiphar raised, uh, uh, raised her eyes towards Yosef. And she got that uh, Yetzirah to go after after Yosef. So we see that Yos- that uh, that Sedom was a place of immorality. It was a place of of, of of individuals constantly following the temptations of their eyes. Lot chose to live over there amongst them because he felt an affinity toward them, and that's alluded by the pasuk Vayisalot et Enab. They were also stringy. Stingy. They were also stingy. They treated guests poorly. Um, so when they found out that Lot had guests, what did they do? <laughs> they come banging on the doors. Come banging on the doors. Let me see, let me see what it is. What does the Pasuk say? Anyone ever pay attention to the Pasuk? All the men who are at the entrance of the house trying to get in. To, to, what are you doing hosting guests? They struck with blindness. Again, the eyes. They struck with blindness. Young and old. And they tried vainly to find... And so they struggled blindly that they couldn't know. Akados Baruch Hu caused confusion there and they couldn't get in. So Akados Baruch Hu created the salt of Sedom, which causes blindness, and that's why we wash our hands, my Maharonim, to signify that that's the tikkun for all the bad things that Sedom did to safeguard a person's, a person's eyes. So now let's go back to that dispute between Lot and his wife. At first, the angels accepted Lot's hospitality. They were there. They were eating. They were having uh, golem, right? They had, they had the hamin in front of them. And only afterwards, they told them, we got to go. God's going to come and destroy uh, destroy the city. Maybe, just maybe, HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to offer Lot and his wife an opportunity to do teshuvah. Maybe that's what it was. Mitzvah, goreret mitzvah. One mitzvah leads to another mitzvah. So, I'm gonna, so they accepted the hospitality. That's hachnasa torchim, that's mitzvah number one. That would make them, motivate them to perform teshuvah for having associated with the people of, of Sedom and choosing to make Sedom the place of their residence. That would be the teshuvah. Um, in fact, we can prove that Lot actually did teshuvah. When they were urging to leave the city, the malachim said... Flee to the mountain. Go to the mountain, lest you be destroyed and obliterated. Rashi says, what does he flee to the mountain? They were encouraging him to go to Abraham. That's where Abraham was, in that direction. That's where we're telling him to go. He lived in the mountains. That's where Abraham went back to the place that he originally was. What did Lord reply to them? I can't go to the mountain. I can't do it. But why? Go there. There's your Abraham is there. He says, Lest the evil attach to me and I die. What does that mean? As she explains, when I was with the people of Sodom, God would see my deeds and he would see the deeds of, of the Sodomites. And I'm the tzaddik because, you know, I, I have something good about me. I lived with Abraham for a lot of my life. So I'm, I'm the tzaddik when, I, when I'm living in Sodom. But when I go to the mountains and now I start living with Abraham, I'm going to be the biggest rasha. I'm going to be a rasha. That the evil will attach to me, and I'm dead. And I, got, I, I, I won't survive. So therefore, the malachim forced him to do some sort of teshuvah, to, to uh, do vidui and confess all the things that he did. Another thing of teshuvah that we've spoken in, in our classes in the past, um, with regards to, um, the, uh, regards to teshuvah that preceded Lot's salvation, but we spoke about David. The, the rabbis tell us in Masechet Avodah Zarah, Lo David Raui Leoto Maase. David, um, uh, uh, David was not was not deserving of that Maase with Bathsheba. 
And I know some people might have some issues over here with what we're going to say. There's a big discussion over here. But basically what the Gemara says, it was ordained from above that David had to fail with Bathsheba. Why? The Gemara says, in order so that a path of Teshuvah, a pathway of repentance for all of Am Yisrael is created. Now all of Am Yisrael can emulate the Teshuvah that David did through watching him you know, regret what he did with, with Bathsheba. Uh, you know, is David is the role model. So we see what he did, and now, so that's what was all ordained from above. So David Amelech is who provided a form of atonement and rectification for all types of sin. So now, what are we saying now? It's impossible to save Lot. Lot is the forefather of David, right? He, that's where David comes from. It's impossible to save Lot until he was motivated to do Teshuvah. In the merit of Lot's Teshuvah, David, who established and demonstrated the path of Teshuvah for all of Klal Israel, is going to descend from him. And hence, the, the Malach tells Lot, don't look behind you. I don't want you just staying here and remaining status quo because you got, because you got David in front of you in, a, in, in, in 10, 15 generations from now. You have to initiate the Teshuvah process. It's got to come from you. And that's how David is going to be able to do the Teshuvah. So don't look behind you. The Malach want him to understand that you have to, that Lot had to first fulfill the Teshuvah. Otherwise, if you don't fulfill Teshuvah, if you don't do Teshuvah, David will not descend from you. And therefore, uh, you, won't be, uh, you won't be saved from, from Sedom. So now Lot goes to his wife and he tells her, give him a little bit of salt. He was hinting at her as well not to look towards the future, not to assume that you are going to be saved in the merit of David Amelech without performing Teshuvah. He was asking her to, to do and perform a very symbolic gesture. By bringing the guests a little bit of salt, she would show them, she would demonstrate that she's not relying on the future. She's not thinking that I'm going to just count and bank myself on David for the reason of my salvation. But rather, that little bit of salt, what does that resemble? That resembles the salt of Sedom that prevents her eyes from seeing future events. Her eyes, it's, it's acting as blinding of things that you shouldn't be seeing in, in the future. And therefore, she would be motivated to do Teshuvah. We need you to do Teshuvah to be saved from all this balagan that's about to happen in this city. But what does she respond? You want me to do this custom? We don't have this custom in this city. This is not the bad. This bad custom we don't have to do, we don't do over here. In other words, what was she saying? You got a wrong lot. The whole reason why we came to the city in this first place is to be enticed by the things that they that they show so that we can look with our eyes with lewdness and promiscuity and all the uh, horrible things that our eyes can see. That's the reason why we're here. We, we, we love the nonsense of Olam Hazeh of this world. We don't think that we're going to be punished. We won't, we're not going to be punished. We have David in the future. He's coming. He's descending from us. Why all of a sudden are you asking me to give him some salt? Why are you going to come and give a little bit of salt of Sedom that blinds the eyes and shows everybody that we're not counting on the future? Lehefech. And that's exactly, exactly what, what she did. She ignored the warning of the Malach and Lot's request to give some salt. She, she, that she not look uh, at the future. And what does the Pasuk say? She looks back and she looks back and she turns into a pillar of salt. Uh, she did not rush to leave Sedom. She did not rush to perform Teshuvah. And hence her punishment is Midah, Keneged Midah. It is measure for measure. She was transformed into that pillar of salt that blinds the eyes to indicate that her main flaw, her main mistake, was that she looked at something which was prohibited, which was the future, when she should have blinded herself. Um, so two reasons, the two reasons that we gave for Lot's wife's punishment really coincide with each other beautifully. The Torah tells us that she was, she was punished because she failed to listen to the Malach's warning, the Malach's warning of don't look behind, and she did look behind him, relying on the fact that it would be the Malchut David that would descend from them and is going to protect them, that's what she thought. And Rashi then says that she was punished for not also giving her malachim guests, her heavenly guests, a little bit of salt. She refused to behave like the salt, the salt that was going to blind the future, ignoring the fact that the dynasty of Levi would descend uh, from them. And in fact, we, there's actually a beautiful connection in Hanach between the 
the Brit of David, the covenant of the dynasty of David, and the covenant of salt. Look at this pasuk in Divrei Yamim. Surely you should know ki Hashem Yisrael, that Hashem, the God of Israel, Natan Mamlacha le David, gave sovereignty to David, Al Israel over Israel, le Olam forever. Lo Ulbanav to him and his children, Berit Melach, a covenant of salt. You read this pasuk. What? What's a covenant? What? A typo? You know? You know? Autocorrect. What? Maybe they meant to say Brit Melech, and they put Melech with Achet, right? What a Brit Melech over here, a covenant of salt. But no, this is exactly what we're saying over here. Everything makes sense. HaKadosh Baruch Hu made the covenant with salt. That's exactly what he made the covenant for, making it an obligation that we have to bring the salt of Sedom, the salt that blinds the eyes with every single korban. And that was designed, that was instituted to teach the, uh, the, the Chotim, the sinners, that if they just simply hold back, if they're able to abstain, prevent themselves from gazing and looking at prohibited things, then they're not going to fall prey to sin. They're, they're not going to have to bring a korban. And therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu established a brit with David and his uh, dynasty, uh, specifically that. They would not have been able to descend from Lot if he had not rectified the flaws of his eyes. He accomplished that by not looking back. And that is the main idea, the main explanation of this whole whole story. So a few things that we can take upon with us uh, back uh, back home. Number one, my macharonim. Okay, my macharonim. Now we know why, why we do my macharonim. Very, very important. You might think, come on, he's not really cleaning my hands. I can go to the, I can go to the bathroom. I can go to the kitchen sink and wash with soap and hand sanitizer. It'll be a lot more clean than the little my macharonim. It's not about that. It's about the salt, representing the salt of Sedom, the salt that was supposed to be on the korban. Number two, shmirat enayin, the importance of watching our eyes from what we see. There's so much putrid in this world. There's so much evil, so much things everywhere we look. It's just all over the place. We have to do a better effort to watch our eyes. It's our eyes that, that gives the strength and the koach to the yetzer to, 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 to entice us to sin. And it's really, really horrible. And once that happens, then what can we do? The satan, he's up there in court. He's in heavenly court. And he's saying, look, look what this guy saw. This, 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 this day. What are you supposed to do? And lo alenu al We're going to see a lot of eyes. We don't want to see many eyes. Right? When it comes our time after 120, maybe we want to see one eye. Maybe uh, we don't want to see more eyes. That, that's bad news. So shmirat enayim, right? And last but not least, of course, probably the main lesson is worry about what you're at now. You have a commandment. You have a mitzvah. An angel's coming and telling you this is what you need to do. Do it. Don't worry and focus on what's going to be in the future. Ah, I'm not going to do, I, I, no, I'm not going to do this because I know what's coming. You don't know what's coming. You don't know what's coming and you don't know what purpose you need to serve right now. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is giving you instruction. Sometimes it's through an angel. Sometimes it's through your friend. You got to find those signs. You got to act on it. You got to work on it now for the present. And once you do that, only Beracha will come. Thank you everybody for joining. Have a wonderful night. Thank mm-hmm. you.